and I am now privileged to introduce our plenary guest speaker, Women Ternes. Uh, I remember Women as a very dynamic, outspoken and efficient labour politician in Norway, a minister for education, research, health, social affairs and even the church, if I remember correctly. Um, but he has also, uh, he holds a, a, a PhD in sociology from John Hopkins, has been professor in Bergen and in Oslo, fellow at Stanford, uh, visiting uh, professor at Harvard, but he has also taken on important international roles, and now I have to read from my, my uh, notes because I can never remember I know you were the director of UNESCO's International Institute of Educational Planning in Paris. That are too many long words for my memory to, to hold. And of course, you were the UNESCO's coordinator on HIV and AIDS. And from 2006, president of the International Social Sciences Council. But most of all, you're an engaging speaker. Women, I look forward to hearing your talk. Please, the floor is yours. First of all, thank you for inviting me. As always, it's a great pleasure to come back to Iceland. It is a place where I immediately feel at home. And at the same time, whenever I come here, there is something new to discover. And also, of course, some new friends to be made. Uh, I was also very much pleased by being invited to this particular audience and this particular group. And the reason is because Almost to the day, 29 years ago, there was a big disaster which struck, first of all, a large part of Europe, but also much of the world, which was the Chernobyl accident, which you may remember. And after that accident, I was uh, asked to chair a commission to address what could be done in similar circumstances. So we produced a report, and basically the mandate asked us to address what should be done in similar nuclear accidents. But starting to look into this, we discovered quickly as social scientists that this would not be the right path to take. And I'm very pleased to see that the path you are taking here is not the path that we were asked to take. And the reason was because we started to look at these disasters not as nuclear disasters, but as examples of a more generic type of social phenomenon. A disaster you can define in different ways. Uh, one of the ways you could define it is that it is a big rupture from that you're not prepared for. So even in spite of all the good work that you're going to do, you're also going to discover that when your lessons are in the books, you have held your seminars and so on, when the next one strikes, it is nevertheless going to take everybody by surprise. So basically what we did at the time was to produce a report which was called information crisis, because that was something that happened whether it was how to address the Titanic sinking and how did the, uh, that accident uh, be addressed, uh, the types of conflicts that, ar that arose, etc. And from that we also identified, so to speak, a generic logic to the way disasters unfold and partly in the conflicts that arise, because conflicts arise between authorities and the general population, but also between the authorities and the mass media. So basically, on the basis of this, uh, we tried to uh, provide decision makers with tools that they could use in similar circumstances. Then, as was mentioned, I became minister. And one of the first things that happened when I joined the government was that something happened to the government and of course the government was not prepared for it. The Norwegian king died. And when the Norwegian king died, I could basically sort of go back to the old report that we had produced and step by step follow all the mistakes we were making in addressing that uh, phenomenon that was occurring. So basically you never know, even, the, even if you have knowledge, and after this little detour, I'm going to tell you, this is not what I'm going to talk about. 
I'm not going to talk about what you do not know. I'm going to talk about why you do not learn. And um, particularly what you do not learn in spite of the fact that science is in place. I'm wondering whether I could place this. Uh, no, it's too short. Okay. It's okay. Yeah, good. So, um, See if this works. This didn't work. I'm trying to see what it's going to turn on. No, this is turning into a minor disaster, is it? <laughs> no. You see? This is a near death experience. <laughs> no? no? Probably no battery. So, that is one of the things you have to have in disasters batteries. I'll rescue you. Okay. I'll Works up. This one works. Okay, I will. We'll manage. That is the second lesson for for a disaster. We we manage. So basically, what I'm going to do is to take you through a uh, arena which now already has produced many disasters, and which will produce probably also at an increasing rate and also with greater strength disasters in the years to come, and that is climate change climate change. It is floods, it's forest fires, it's droughts, it is uh, the disappearance of whole, com whole communities, etc. So uh, the key scientific input for the social discussion here is the reports that have been produced by the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change. And basically, what is it that these reports are telling us? Well, they are telling us that there are some very important global trends, and these global trends are inescapable. They are going to happen. They are, in fact, happening now. And uh, we can use different indicators. Well, let's see whether the pointer works. Yes, the pointer works. So we can use, for example, at uh, land ocean temperature. The water is outside Iceland is warming up, as they are everywhere. And not only that, you can also look at atmospheric carbon dioxide contents, which is be, have been measured for several decades now in Hawaii, and we see that they are rising. We can translate this also to what is happening in terms of disasters or major weather events in different parts of the world, for example, in the United States, where they have mapped it quite well. And uh, here you can see partly rising temperatures, you can see uh, floods, and uh, heat waves, etc., that can, is uh, recorded. Uh, you can see it uh, in a disaster that is unfolding now in California, and it has for the last five years with a per the biggest drought in recorded uh, history. And you can clearly see it, and it's visible. And new political measures and restrictions have been introduced. And um, we already know here it said that. 2014 on track to be the hottest year on record. Now we know that it was the hottest year on record. And we know also that the first quarter of this year is even hotter than last year. So temperatures are rising. And then there is one more thing that is being said by IPCC. And that is that the processes that we observe surely are geophysical. They are chemical, they are meteorological and they translate into processes that are ecological and biological because all species will be affected, fisheries, birds, uh, domestic animals even where you can keep them. But what we see is not the forces of nature autonomously at work, like planetary motions, something that is not affected by human actions. In fact, the forces of, na um, for forces of nature are set in motion by human actions. And therefore, the key causes of climate change are primarily social. And also, the key consequences will be consequences for humans, increased social risks. Lands for agriculture will be destroyed and is already being destroyed by inundations or drought. Uh, California is the big agricultural state in the, state in the United States, and it's going to be severely affected. Um, and um, 
It takes two, three hundred liters of water to produce one single almond. It's a key fact, and yet they are expanding the uh, land used for almonds in California. And they are surely going to stop that. Poverty will increase. Uh, social inequalities will be sharpened because some areas that are most exposed is where you find the poorest populations of the earth, like in the lower lands of Bangladesh. Uh, and diseases will be spread because insects will, so to speak, uh, conquer new territory. Migration will mount because those that are threatened or affected by climate change will become refugees. And social crisis, therefore, also can multiply and conflicts <coughs> may become more pronounced. So basically, environmental impacts have human causes, like you see in this very telling picture. But there is an additional problem, and that is that in complex systems like the climate system, the environmental systems, the causal chains are often long, and you often do not foresee how you yourself are going to be affected by your own actions. It's not like your everyday activities where you do something in order to uh, obtain something. Here you can set things in motion that affect you without your uh, knowing it. And clearly also, therefore, climate change has had not only long-term effects, but also floods. This is taken from uh, New York. And you can see here also that it translates into various kinds of disasters. So social problems will be amplified. And as a way of characterizing these uh, changes, those that have contributed least to these changes will be most affected. For example, small islands in the Pacific. Uh, the poor will be hurt the most. They have the least resilient societies, as we see from, say, mudslides in Brazil. And those with the least resources will face the great, gravest impacts. For example, their whole social, the basis for their societies may be destroyed. But we may also, in our countries, have seen some long-term effect. Lester Brown is one of the old gurus in the environmental movement and also a scientist. And he says that vast dust bowls threaten tens of millions with hunger because crops will be destroyed, prices will rise, and they cannot be, uh, cannot afford them. In 2007, we had food riots in many places of the world, which had to do with the abrupt rise in prices of food. There are some that are already trying to address these problems, and one example is the Pentagon. And the Pentagon produces an annual report which is uh, called uh, the uh, Climate Change Report. And in 2014, they call it Adaptation Roadmap because they see it not just in terms of environmental change, but also how it can affect the military situation of the United States. And also, if you want to solve those military problems, you cannot do it by military means. You have to do it by means which address what causes conflicts. But there are some ominous gaps and the gaps are the gaps between evidence, what is happening, and I've given you some, and what people believe. And there is even outright denial of what is happening. And there is also a gap between the urgent need for effective action and the political delay <coughs> of those actions. And in not only is there delay, there is also outright obstruction. You may have heard there are both companies and very rich persons, the Koch brothers in the United States are probably the most prominent example, who obstruct the dissemination of knowledge about what is happening. So therefore, there are gaps between what we know and what we do. And then when we use the term like there are gaps, we also have to take into account that the we that know and the we that should act and do may not be the same we. So our terminology may be a little bit inappropriate here. It's interesting to know that the most potent country in the world, the United States, is also a, a country that is a laggard in their views on climate change. Here you see the percentage of residents of different countries who say that global climate change is a major threat to their country. And you can see that it is in South Korea, they are most concerned. And in this list, it is the United States, which is least concerned, but we will also find that several 
European countries are among those that are not really alarmed, at least not yet. And we cannot beat over chest in the Nordic countries. These are some curves showing the concern people have for different types of environmental threats, like depletion of the ozone layer, acid rain, or uh, climate change, and or greenhouse effects. This is taken from Norway, from uh, oops, oh, suddenly started working. Uh, from 18, uh, 1989 to 2011, and what you basically see here is that oops, the people who are concerned is in effect uh, declining, and declining substantially also, that there are more people who are not concerned than there used to be. It may have changed a little bit the last couple of years. Now, it's very important not just what is public opinion, but where these opinions are located in the power structure of society. And sometimes you will see that denial is correlated with power, which is very evident, for example, in the United States, where the largest party, which now controls both the House and the Senate, their leaders are among the most prominent deniers of climate change. And again, uh, we cannot beat our chest uh, um, in the Nordic countries. So our finance minister in Norway uh, just uh, last week uh, expressed the view that it is not likely that uh, climate change is caused by human actions. There are also partisan differences in where our opinions located. And it is not only among politicians. We see the same thing. We also see it among scientists. This is a op-ed piece that was published in the Wall Street Journal in January 2012. And if it, it looks at the signatures uh, uh, down at the bottom, this is really a list of professors with the highest ranks in the academic community, starting with Claude Lever, who is one of the most prominent intellectuals in France. But there are professors from Princeton, MIT, etc., who say basically, don't worry. This is just natural variation. So therefore, one can raise the question, how useful is scientific information, the type of information that you are going to provide for the, Norwegian, the Nordic countries to become more prepared for what may happen? So uh, I'm going, therefore, to address the questions, why is it that people do not want to change their mind? That's my key question. And what, then, does it take for them to change their minds? So uh, again, starting with the knowledge that we have and also why they don't change their minds in spite of all the evidence that is accumulating. So in order to answer this question, I started with a little detour. Now I'm going to take on the grand detour before I return to the story. And I'm going to start with some of the greatest stories that humans have either told or invented, the story of creation the story of creation, and we had an authoritative source, which I learned about when I was Minister of Church Affairs, and there were some conceptual tipping points. And here you see them. Uh, according to the Christian tradition, uh, the Bible starts with, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. And therefore, the act of creation was a reflection of him. So if we are to understand how the world is constructed, you also have to know, or first have to know, how God's minds work. So basically, how did God create the blueprint for the universe when he created the universe? And the answer is that God is perfect. And if God is perfect, then of course, he has to use perfect figures in the construction of the universe. So what is a perfect figure? A circle is a perfect figure. So in order to construct the universe, you have to construct it with, by the means of circles. And also, if he's perfect, of course, he has a pure language, and the most pure of all languages is mathematics. So God is a great mathematician, and he loves circles. So when he said, let's make man in our image, he would make it with the earth at the center of uh, circles, and man as the central figure in the story. So this is now, now we know what God wants, and what did he do? Well, he created the world in a way which is depicted in this figure, with the Earth in the middle, and then Luna, the moon, and then Mercury and the various planets outside in layers. Okay? So here we have basically found out the map that God used when he constructed the world. 
And here we have the proof. If you lie down on the ground in a warm summer night, they are not so often uh, that warm in Iceland, but if you go to uh, Mallorca or anywhere else for your summer vacation, you can lie on the back and basically let the heavens rotate around. And you can record that on your camera like this. And of course also placing the man in the middle of the story, man at the center of this universe. There is another proof you can just, that you can do with Iceland, you can do it now, today, yesterday when the weather was so nice, the sun rises and basically moves in a circle over the sky. So here we have the proof of how God created the universe. So voila, uh, God used the perfect circle in the construction of the universe, the earth at its center, and this is what is called the Ptolemaic conception of the universe. This is basically how it is constructed. The sun moves around the earth. But this caused all sorts of problems with planetary motion, planets suddenly moving backwards and all sorts of strange things happened. <laughs> so basically one had to reconstruct the universe and that was what is called the Copernican revolution. And then it was really revolutionary, not just in the sense of circulation, but placing now the sun at the center of the universe. And this is therefore the redrawing the circles. Now you see Sol at the, uh, at the uh, center, and then you have uh, the tel Telus, the Earth, and uh, then the various planets in circles outside. Now, why do I tell you this story? Why this grand detour? And the reason is still not everybody is convinced. So, one in four Americans thinks the sun goes around the Earth according to service, okay? This is after 500 years. One fifth of the American population does not believe this story. So there is a lesson here. Change in worldview takes time, decades, sometimes centuries. And sometimes what happens is change in bits and parts of this story only. For example, you can think that it moves in circle, but the Earth is flat. So that basically this is the way the universe works, and you better watch out when you sail from Iceland and go, for example, uh, westward, this might happen at the edge of the, of the Earth. Oops. Now, this also means that scientific uh, progress uh, is very much delayed and only happening in parts. This uh, shows that only half of Britons do not believe in Darwinian evolution, in spite of the fact that Darwin was a Brit. And the percentage of people in the United States, and they use often the United States because they've got good repeated service, the number of people who accept, or the percentage that accept Darwinism declined between 1985 and 2005. And the United States is not alone. In many countries where they have basically religious constructed views of the universe, there is a huge percentage that does not believe in evolution, 50% or more. Now, what does this demonstrate to us? Well, we have a, what we could call the enlightenment theory of attitude change. How is it that people change their opinions? And the story basically about this theory goes like this. It's first of all based on a very big optimistic idea. Everybody is educated and enlightened and cultivated by knowledge. So what we have to do to make people change their minds is provide knowledge. So education will open minds and science will advance society. However, people can be wrong. Even I can be wrong. And perhaps even you can be wrong. But then this optimistic story goes that when you are informed, you change your mind. So therefore, we should have organized our societies with freedom of expression because that promotes truth. And we should also advocate and allow rational debate because that improves public policy. And your undertaking is an illustration of such an undertaking. So, therefore, the measure we need in order to make people get rational use of the world and so on is more education and better science. And the question, therefore, are we there? Are we there? And I show you some figures that we, it doesn't always work this way. So, I think uh, what we see from these figures that I showed you from the United States, from Norway and so on, is that people loathe to change their opinions. They don't want to change their opinions in spite of the evidence that they get. People are pig-headed, inalterable, and unshakable in their beliefs. And you may know your neighbors are like that. Um, they are not 
convinced by information, they are not swayed by knowledge, they ignore arguments and evidence, and even the best educated, as we saw in this op-ed piece from the Wall Street Journal, and even scientists. So the question is therefore, why? So now I'm on track with my, not the detour, but the big story, and this is where I'll start. This is what I would call the empty heads fallacy. The empty heads fallacy, and that basically assumes that people have an open mind. Or even more than that, that the mind is a clean slate. A clean slate, and a, state, and a statement to the effect of that is Mark Twain, who said that an open mind leaves a chance for someone to drop a worthwhile thought into it. The mind is open, the slate is clean. But the problem with this view is that people's opinions are not a jumble of disconnected ideas that, so to speak, uh, float around. And they are not something that people have just in bits and parts. People's opinions are interconnected. So that is the first key thesis against uh, the, uh, the empty health fallacy. They are not just in place, they are interconnected. And opinions are linked in a logical lattice. So one opinion is tied to another one, also in biological construction. And that means that the mind, or your mindset, functions as a filter. Or put differently, perception is selection. You search for what confirms what you already believe. You overlook what discredits what you believe. You ignore what jars with the views that you have, and you forget what contradicts what you already think is the case. Therefore, you don't believe what you see. You see what you believe. So the, it, this is then in contrast to the empty head fallacy, that the head, your head is a crowded place. There is something there already when you meet new information. And therefore, in order to change an opinion, you have to remove another. I'm putting this sharply. Sometimes you have to remove a whole mindset. So you basically have to break loose an opinion from this lattice. And therefore, this means that the enlightenment theory of attitude change is inadequate. And it's inadequate for another reason also, and that is because your identity is what makes you recognizable to yourself. Every morning when I wake up, I start by looking in the mirror. I see some strange creature there, and I try to figure out who it is. And the reason may be that I've gotten so old that I don't remember anymore who is there, or that my eyesight is so bad that I can no longer distinguish who it is. But after a while I'm working on this, I recognize myself, and myself is myself of yesterday. So um, I'm recognizable to myself and to others. And we have expressions to this effect, I'm true to character. I act today the way I acted yesterday, and people know more or less how a grumpy fellow I am, etc., and therefore they know how to handle me when they meet me. And therefore also your identity is your beliefs or your mindset. Uh, so again, uh, this is what I see in the mirror when I wake up. The enlightenment theory is inadequate. And uh, your identity is what makes you recognizable to yourself and to others, through the character and your beliefs. So the question is therefore, how is that you can maintain your identity? And the way you maintain your identity or your mindset is by selective perception, selective memory, reinterpretation, rationalization, and cognitive dissonance. So basically, what I'm telling you here is what you already know. That this is something that social scientists have been working on for a uh, hundred years. Uh, Freud, for example, when he discussed rationalization, it was how to cope with what you don't like uh, either to see or don't like to see yourself as. So that means that, uh, that uh, people are cognitive escape artists. Escape artists. What they cannot reject, they rationalize. What does not tally with what they believe can be overlooked, and what does not Harmonized can be overheard. And therefore, in many cases, your imagination can trump reality. 
because it maintains your identity. But there is even more to this story, and that is what I call the double embedding of attitudes. Because the mindset is not just an isolated set mind. Your attitudes are linked to your associates. The double embedding of attitude means that the logical lattice that I have described is also anchored in a social network. And that means that what you believe determines with whom you belong. And this audience is an example. You basically believe more or less the same thing and you choose to meet in an out of the place. place. Um, uh, so it uh, determines who you associate with. So it basically means that your attitudes are lodged both in a logical lattice and in a social network in this fashion. So this double amending means that this nothing that it means that opinions come in ensembles, not just isolated opinions, and friends come in clusters and both come together. And therefore it means that people support each other's misconceptions. So if there is another religious congregation, you say that, well, they are a different congregation. Of course, what they believe is something very strange or stupid. Uh, but they support each other's mis uh, misconceptions. They meet and they sing and so on. Or they go to scientific conferences. And it also means that if you want to change your opinions, you have to change your friends. And that can be done in two ways, either by getting a different set of friends or changing the way that your friends are. Now, taking part in such a change is complicated, arduous, and painful. And here you see an example, a sort of standard survey table where you have Republicans, Democrats, and Independents, whether they believe in creationism as opposed to Darwinism, belief in uh, God-guided evolution, or belief in evolution without God, or you could add also other attitudes like, do you believe in the free market? Or do you think that uh, Putin is out to get us? Uh, or that uh, the Arab Spring is a conspiracy to, uh, that was started by ISIL, which are now getting to us and so on. So there are all sorts of attitudes that can be clustered here. And not only that, sometimes also our opinions are the opinions we are, so to speak, paid to have. Your attitude can depend, depend on your economic interests, and you not rarely see that is, quite often you can see also scientists tell what they are being paid to tell. And Upton Sinclair put it this way, it's difficult to get a man to understand something and his salary depends on his not understanding it. So that leaves us with a key question, and that is, how then do attitudes change? How can they change? And my argument here is that it's what I call event-driven attitude change. Dramatic events, and now I'm back to you, disasters. Dramatic events can attack both your belief system, what you believe is the case, and it can also disrupt your social relations. So rather than your attitudes being changed, and I'm again putting this sharply now, rather than being changed by what we call the force of argument, the enlightenment theory of attitude change, they are changed by the force of circumstance. And events, big events, dramatic events, can unhinge both, both the logical lattice as well as the social network. In other words, events speak louder than words. We have a classical story about, about such an attitude change. And there was a guy called Saul and he was uh, hired by the Romans to persecute the early Christians. And he went to Damascus to persecute even more. But on the road to Damascus, he was struck by something, lightning or whatever it was. He was totally blinded, he fell off his horse, and he was more or less uh, unconscious or semi-conscious for three days. But he was taken care of, of all people by some Christians. And then he converted, because he took it as a sign that he should convert. 
And therefore, such an event goes under the name of a Damascene conversion. What happens to you on the road to Damascus? The Damascene conversion. And this means that change is, first of all, a replacement of your early beliefs. He persecuted the Christians, he turned Christian. And it was a change in his mental map, how the world is constructed, from whatever Roman notions he had, or Jewish notions he had about uh, how the world was constructed, to the Christian construction, different mental map, a shift in priorities, how he should conduct his life, a shift not just in conceptions about what is, but what ought to be, what is a good life that they should try to lead, a change in presumption about how the world works and how it must be changed, and, of course, a change in associates and accomplices. It was a dramatic event, and it's a sort of archetypical story about this type of change that I'm talking about. So, therefore, we can talk about event-generated attitude change, and there are some prominent recent examples illustrated by disasters. One is, of course, the tsunami that hit much of Southeast Asia, or the 9-11, uh, uh, planes that flew into the Twin Towers and changed attitudes, or the uh, Fukushima uh, accident that came after the, uh, the tsunami in uh, Japan. So basically, the argument that I'm making is that people have these logical constructed mental maps and they have a social network in which these maps are embedded, and when a dramatic event hits, it attacks both of them. That means that, so to speak, they loosen. You cannot longer entertain what you believe, so you unhinge, you know, this cannot be true, is the first reaction. <laughs> this cannot be true, and if it cannot be true, something else must be true, and you have to reorder your mind. And therefore, also, that events shatter mindset and uncoupled relations, and when they are uncoupled, they can be reconstructed. For example, uh, this is, the, of course, the classical uh, Gestalt psychology. Is this a waist that you see here, a waist stand up, or are there two faces that turn into each other? You can look at the same facts in a very different way. So you have to, therefore, when the dots are unconnected, you can reconnect the dots. And a new pattern, a new narrative, and a new coherent story can be constructed with bits and parts of what you already had. And also, you get a new configuration or social relations, like illustrated by Paul. An interesting question now is, who are those most immune to shocking information, to new information? And the answer to this is that those who have the most elaborate logical lattices or tightly joined belief system lodged in a potent social network. So where do we find that? Well, of course, we have the usual suspects in different types of political movements, and you uh, need not listen to many political debates where you can, there is one thing you can be sure about in the political debate, that none of those who engage in debate are going to convince each other. You have an electoral campaign in Britain, and uh, did you see anyone said, oh, that's a very good idea. I, I, I think I agree with you. That on further thought, uh, yes, I agree. I think I will vote for you. Even. Okay? You don't see that much often. So you have the usual suspects. But you also have, of course, uh, are typically uh, religious groupings that have constructed different uh, views of the world. And uh, also in science, you have schools of thought. If you have followed the debate among economists over the last uh, five, six years after the initial crisis starting in 2007, 2008, uh, you have, for example, what is called in the United States, freshwater economists and saltwater economists. And the freshwater economists are those who are on the Great Lakes, freshwater. The Chicago School, which is very conservative and don't believe in Keynesianism, whereas at Berkeley and on the coast of the Atlantic, Harvard, Princeton, and so on, they do believe it. So they have different schools of thought and they argue, but they don't convince each other. Usually the one school dies, and that's the way they change. So basically, therefore, we have an intellectual immune system, which means that knowing more about the issues means knowing more about the counter argument and how to refute the counter argument as well as knowing which collective can provide intellectual and moral support if you are in doubt. 
And instead of changing your mind, you try to convince yourself by trying to convert others. They are also what has been called true believers, and they proselytize. They try to serve as missionaries for what they believe. So here you have two people who have opposed views. Richard Dawkins, the, who wrote uh, The God Delusion, and we have, of course, uh, the lovely Pope, uh, Franz, and they have each their book. But if you imagine they meeting in the debate in order to convince the other, do you think that it is likely that either of them would change their mind in spite of all the good arguments? No, they have very elaborately constructed system, and of course they have a social organization also which supports the beliefs that they already have, whether it is in science or in religion. Eric Koffer wrote the book, um, The True Believer, uh, put it this way, doctrines can serve as fact-proof screens between the faithful and the realities of the world, which is also basically a statement of the type of argument that I've been making here. There are some examples where people and events really change people's outlook. This is uh, taken from uh, Business Week in 2012, the October, the last issue in October. And it is the conclusion that Business Week drew after Hurricane Sandy. The picture you see here is Lower Manhattan, which was flooded, the streets were flooded, and you have to ask the question, what's happened? And you can say it's a flood. Uh, it's a freak event, freak weather event. Or you can reinterpret the whole story within which you place this event. It's global warming, stupid, which was um, the new story that they put forward. So the lesson from climate change and attitude, uh, attitude change is that if you're thinking about global warming is enmeshed in you thinking about the role of markets, what they should be, or the role of the state or religion, it is very hard to change one set of opinions without changing the others. So for example, now when the Pope is going to publish an, an encyclica on climate change, conservative Catholics are very worried because their mentor, their religious mentor, is going to tell them something which they don't believe and they would not like to hear. So some already try to say, please, Pope, don't say what you think because then I may be forced to think something else. Now, the interesting things also from the point of view where you are working is that the trends in climate change, they translate into all sorts of specific events, uh, floods, uh, forest fires, uh, hurricanes, uh, etc. There is a wide set of events. And again, therefore, this is a great opportunity to change one's mind, that the world is getting so turbulent in terms of not longer fitting the map that you have, that you may have to change it. So basically then my story is that uh, the key point, event generated attitude change, um, the events that has have, it should have been there, the events that have happened and disasters that have occurred have been very bad. Some, as you know, like Sandy, uh, like uh, Katrina, etc. We have given them names and they reside in our memory as names, have been very bad, or the, the uh, earthquakes in Iceland, uh, they have been bad. The question in terms of changing people's minds is this, but they may not yet have been bad enough for people to change their minds. So, uh, if you want to pursue uh, what I've uh, talked about here, you can find it in a free publication, uh, which can be downloaded from the web, also under the auspices of, uh, of uh, the Nordic Council, or Nordforsk, and uh, this uh, book, which also takes up other examples and elaborates on the arguments and gives um, references and stuff in the usual way, it's called Hot Topic Cold Comfort. So if you just Google Hot Topic Cold Comfort, you will fairly quickly be led to a site where you can download this uh, whole uh, publication. And um, if you don't uh, find the um, Norfolk version, uh, those of you who prefer it could find, can find a Chinese <laughs> translation and it might be more accessible. Thank you very much.